testing my microphone. It's a blessing to be here, amen? Glad to see so many people out this evening. Are you ready to study the word of God? Let's not waste any time. I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. As it is my tradition, I invite you to please pray for yourself. We are praying for what? The Holy Spirit, amen? amen? We're told by the servant of the Lord that God's people pray all too little for the Spirit of God. And so let us pray that the Holy Spirit would come and lead and direct us, not into some truth, but into all truth. And please pray for myself as well that I'll be yielded into the Master's hand to be used as he so desires. So I'm going to kneel to pray right now if you're inclined to do so. You can kneel with me. I invite you for the next 60 seconds just to pray in your heart silently. Ask the Lord to cleanse your mind, your thoughts, to send his spirit. And when you hear my voice, I'll be closing us out in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for for being God, Amen. for revealing yourself t- as a God of love, a God of kindness. Yes, Lord. And that is why we approach your throne and we come with faith, because the way that you have dealt with us in times past causes us to realize that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, Father, we come acknowledging our nothingness, our weakness, our need to be cleansed of our sins. Please forgive us of all of our transgressions. Blot out our iniquities, we ask. And please, Lord, cover us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Fill us with the presence of thy Spirit. Cause us to know you, for you said to know you is life eternal. Lord, I'm asking that your holy angels will be dispatched into your courts this evening and that they would minister to us in a special way. Our minds need to be stirred up to understand the magnitude of this great controversy, what you want to do in our lives, how much of yourself you've actually placed online so that we might be redeemed. Father, take over, speak to us. I yield myself into your hand, and I simply say, have thine own way, Lord. Thank you for hearing this prayer. For all things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this evening. I want you to go with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 20, excuse me, the book of Hebrews, there's no chapter 20. The book of Hebrews, chapter 9. The book of Hebrews, chapter 9, and we're going to begin at verse 27. Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning at the 27th verse. If you're there, just say amen. Once again, Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning at verse 27. Please, just let me know when you arrive there. Just say amen. amen. The Bible tells us here, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, But after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered for the sins of many. Are you with me? And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Bible says that the day is coming soon when Jesus Christ will return. And the word of God says when he returns, he will return without sin unto salvation for the purpose of delivering his people from the presence of sin. Are you with me right now? Go with me to the book of 1 John chapter 3 now. 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to begin at the first verse there. Another familiar scripture, I believe. I believe we're going to look at a host of familiar scriptures this evening. 1 John chapter 3, looking at verse 1. When you arrive there again, just say amen. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, another familiar scripture. The Bible says here, behold, what manner of love? The Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the 
sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Verse two, beloved, now are we the sons of God. Listen closely. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him what? As he is. The Bible says, when he appears, we shall be like him. Well, what will he be like when he appears? The Bible told us in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, when he returns again, he will come without are you following right now? Jesus comes without sin. And when he comes, he's coming for a people that are without sin. How do we obtain to this? Because it can be daunting to us as human beings. You start hearing victory over sin, without sin. And if your eyes are not focused in the right direction, you're definitely going to go in the wrong direction. How do we obtain to this? Simple scriptures. I want you to go with me to the book of John. Where are we going in our Bibles? John, the 15th chapter. John, the 15th chapter. And I want you to see what Jesus said. John chapter 15, and we're going to look at the third verse, another familiar scripture. The word of God says here, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. What has God given to us to cleanse us? What has God given unto us to cleanse us? His word. His word is that cleansing, purifying agent to make whole the souls of men. Matter of fact, open your Bible now to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 12. Psalm the 12th chapter, we're going to look at the 6th verse. Psalm chapter 12, looking at verse 6. Psalm chapter 12, looking at verse 6. When you arrive, say Amen. Bible says in Psalm, the 12th chapter, looking at verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. The words of the Lord are what? As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Bible says that God's word is pure. When it states there that the word of God is pure, it's not just simply declaring that God's word is without, uh, it's not just saying it's pure like we were looking at it earlier. His word has the ability to cleanse. But it actually means that God's word is infallible. It faileth not. It is perfect. Are you with me right now? It is dependable. It is sure. Are you getting this right now? God's word can be trusted. God's word is infallible. And if God's word is infallible and God's word is true, that means whatever God's word says will be. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, listen, I'm going to share with you a lot of different principles and concepts tonight. I want you just to follow along with me in the Bible. Are you with me right now? Because these things are important and you'll see some definitions come out of the Bible for some points that you are very familiar with. But my prayer is that some lights will begin to shine in your mind. The word of God is pure. It is infallible. It changeth not. You can depend upon it. Matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. Again, go to the book of John chapter 1. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, where the Bible speaks a little bit more about the word of God, the infallible, trustworthy, dependable, unfailing, perfect word of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You know what I like about that scripture? Just listen closely to it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word the same was in the beginning with the same word that we have today is the same word that's been in existence from eternity past God's word has not changed it never will change because it's pure it is infallible the word that was is the word that is amen furthermore the word of God goes on to say Speaking about this issue of the word of God. Are you with me right now? Are you with me right now? John chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 3. Another familiar scripture. In John chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So God's word is pure. It's infallible. It changes not. It will never fail. 
And it's also life. Are you with me? And it's also light. The word of God brings to light the life of God. Does that sound good? Did you hear what I said right now? The word of God brings to light because light illuminates. Light brings things into vision. The word of God brings to light the life of God. Is that true? That's a fact. You know, what's the definition of light? Would you say that light is the absence of darkness? It's life? Can there be darkness where there is light? Go with me to the book of John. Where are we going in our Bibles? First John. Where are you going in your Bible? Open your Bible to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Let's gather up the gems, brothers and sisters. 1 John chapter 1, another familiar scripture. We're looking now at verse, let's look at verse 5. If you're there, say amen. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, This then is the message which we have heard of them, and declare we unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Do you notice that the same way the Bible defines the word of God is the same way the Bible defines God himself? God's word is light. God is light. God's word is life. God is the living God. Which lets me know that the word of God reveals the character of God. Simple and plain. Does that make sense? Matter of fact, there is no other agency in existence that can reveal the character of God more perfectly than the word of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says that. Go with me back to John chapter 1. Let's look at verse 14. Once again, speaking of the word of God, John chapter 1, and we're looking at the 14th verse. The word of God here says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When the Bible tells us that the word of God revealed the glory of God, it's simply declaring here that the word of God revealed the character of God. Emmanuel, God with us. The word of God revealed the character of God. Are you following? When the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and the glory of God was revealed, this was the most marked manifestation of the character of God that the universe had ever beheld. Are you with me now? Is that truth? I'm going to ask that question again. When the word of God was made flesh, the angels in heaven, the fallen angels, and all of the unfallen worlds, when the word of God was made flesh, all of these beings, received a revelation of God's character that they never beheld before. Which lets me know that the only way, listen closely, that the only way the character of God can be truly measured is by his word. Which also means, if God's word can ever be proven to not be pure. Let me say this again. Which lets me know, if God's word ever fails, can be found fallible, faulty, blemished on any point, the character of God is brought into question. If one of the words of God fall to the ground and do not accomplish that which God said his word will do, God is a liar. 
his character is tarnished. The throne of God is staked against the infallibility of his word. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how can one prove whether or not the word of God indeed is pure? Go back to Psalms chapter 12. I want you to look at the scripture. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6. In Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, the answer lies therein. The Bible tells us there, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth and purified. How many times? Do you see here in the scripture that God likens his word unto silver that has been taken, placed inside a furnace made of earth, and then that furnace of earth is heated up seven times to do what? To prove the purity of the word of God. Question, can you take the word of God and place it inside of an earthen furnace and heat it up seven times? Can you? Before we even deal with an issue like that, let's just deal with the point. Let's just deal with this issue how God, God, all right, God said that his word is like silver. Did he say that? Yes. Let's see what the Bible has to say about silver. Go with me to the book of Daniel chapter 11. Where are you going in your Bibles? Daniel 11 chapter, and we're going to go to verse 43. The only reason we're going to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 43 is so that we might learn something about silver that's very important to our discussion this evening, to our search in the word of God this evening. Go with me to Daniel chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 43. It tells us something about silver. When you arrive there, say amen. It says, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of what? What did the word of God call silver? Treasure. Did you not see that? He said the silver is a what? Treasure. Is the word of God a treasure? Are you sure? Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Where are you going in your Bibles? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to begin at verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 beginning at verse 6. Silver is a treasure. God likens his word unto silver. Does that mean that God's word is a treasure? The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, looking at verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of what? Stop for a second. How did God command the light to shine out of darkness? With his what? Give me a Bible scripture that proves that. Very good. Go with me to the book of, that's very good. Go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms, go to Psalms. Psalms chapter 33, let's look at verse 6. Psalm chapter 33, and we're looking at verse 6. I know I'm asking you questions that you know the answers to, but I want you just to think. In Psalm chapter 33, looking at verse 6, the Bible says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9 says, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So it's clear. It was the creative power contained within the word of God that brought forth life. Amen? Amen. Go back to 2 Corinthians. Now we're looking at chapter 4, back to verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, back to verse 6. For God who commanded the light, for God whom with his creative power commanded the light to shine out of what? For God with the creative power of his word who caused the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now look at the next verse. Now we have this treasure. What treasure? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is revealed to us in the face of whom? Jesus Christ. But who's Jesus Christ? In the beginning was the? <laughs> now we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure, that, what treasure is it that we have in earthen vessels? It's the word. What are the earthen vessels? What's the treasure? The word. Where did God say he's depositing this treasure? In earthen vessels. And who are those earthen vessels? You are. I asked the question earlier, can you take the word of God and place it inside a furnace made out of earth? You said no. 
But the Bible just declared that God is seeking to place that treasure, his word, in you, an earthen vessel. See, you don't even know anything about yourself. Know thyself. Now question, can this earthen vessel be heated up seven times? Oh, you're going to say yes now, of course. Let's see what the Bible says, though, amen? Go with me to the book of Peter. Where are we going now? Peter. We're going to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, looking at verse 12. In 1 Peter chapter 4, looking at the 12th verse, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you. Are you seeing the earthen furnace getting heated up? And what is it that heats up these earthen furnaces? Trials. The Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning these fiery trials, which are to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So when the fiery trials come, when the furnace is getting heated up, what is the purpose of these trials? It's to try who? It's to try who? It's to try you? What about you is it trying? What about you is it trying to see if you, how smart you are? You're not going to make it through this one without a PhD. Not going to do it. You're lost. You need a master's degree to get over this one. What is it that it's trying to try in you? Go with me to James, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. What verse am I going to in James chapter 1? Verse, come on, two, my brethren, count it all a joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So when the fiery trials come to heat up that earthen furnace, which is you, what is it seeking to try? Your faith. Huh? Did it say that? My brethren, count it all a joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith. So that means these fiery trials that are heating up the earthen vessel, that furnace made of earth, it's all about trying your faith. But I mean, where do you even obtain faith from in the first place? Romans 10, 17, remember that one? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means when fiery trials come to you, they are trying your dependence on the word of God. But hold on a second. Because brothers and sisters... We learned earlier that the only way that the character of God can truly be measured is by proving the integrity, the purity, the infallible, trustworthy, cannot fail nature of his word. You understanding what I just said? That means that when fiery trials come to you, to try and see if you will cling to the master and stand fast upon his word and wait for his promises to come through. Not only are those trials, try, not only are those trials trying or proving your dependence or lack thereof in the word of God, but those trials also try the purity of the word of God. Yes, Do you get what I just told you? In other words, when trials come to you, how you handle trials actually, are you following right now? Yes. How you handle your trials actually testify as to whether or not the word of God should be trusted. Brothers and sisters, listen, I'll say it one more time. When we come under test, the word of God, the character of God is brought into test. Yeah. 
Can God's word really lift that person up? Can God's word really transform their thinking, their speaking, their appetites, and their passions? Can God's word really fulfill that which it said it can do? If we stand on the promises and hold fast to the word of God until we see his promises come through, it is a declaration to the universe that God is true. Through your life. However, if we do not stand upon the promises and we crumble and we fall to temptation, we are giving the devil occasion to mock the purity of the word of God. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that this great controversy is much bigger than you and I? Matter of fact, do you realize that the great controversy came into existence because Lucifer questioned the integrity of the word of God? You don't believe? Go to the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Where are you going in your Bibles? In Isaiah the 14th chapter, we're going to begin at verse 12. You're very familiar with this chapter in the Bible, I'm sure. The Bible says there, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Stop. What did he say in his heart? What did he mean by that? I will ascend into heaven. Go to Romans chapter 10 quickly. Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at the sixth verse over there. Romans, the 10th chapter, looking at the sixth verse. Look what the Bible says over there. It says, but the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, which is to bring Christ down from above. So when Lucifer was saying in his heart, I will ascend into heaven, what was he saying? I want to take Christ down. But who's Christ? The word of God. I want to take the word of God down. From the very beginning, he was trying to bring the word of God into question. Brothers and sisters, do you think that he stopped? The Bible tells us clearly in Revelation 12 and verse 12, Therefore ye joy see heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great, because he knoweth that he hath but a... And he is taking every opportunity possible within this short time frame to smear. The purity of the word of God. <laughs> the question of the great controversy balances on this issue. And I can't help when I think about issues like this. It draws me back to thinking about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know who I'm talking about, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they are on the plain of Dura. And the music played, the cymbals, the sap, the psaltery, all of the music. And everybody was commanded to do what? But the three faithful Hebrew, Hebrews did what? Because God's word said, thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to any graven image. Are you with me right now? And so they stood upon the word of God. And then they were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar says, is this thing true? That you did not bow down when the music was played? Hold on. I'll give you one more chance. We'll have them play the music one more time. And now you bow down. Because if you don't, who is that God that can deliver you out of mine hands? But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah return and say, oh king, live forever. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. Sometimes you have to talk like that. You know, we're not careful on this one, king. Respectfully so. They said, King, our God is able to deliver us. But if he chooses not to, we won't bow down. Because his word said, thou shalt not. Are you with me right now? So they go into the furnace. How many? 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the furnace. And what did they do with that furnace? They heated up seven times hotter than it ever was before. And then in the midst of the fire, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar jumped up off of his throne and said, hold on a second. Did we not throw three in there? Why is it that I see four? And the fourth looks like whom? The Son of God. Brothers and sisters, why did that transpire? Why did God even stand with them in that fashion? It's because when humanity holds fast to the word of God, when humanity exalts the integrity of the word of God under adversity, it is in those situations that the glory of God can be made manifest. It's in the fire that the truth of the word of God is truly revealed to be true. It was on the cross that God was revealed to be God. Come on now. It was on the cross? So what is he saying to you when he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his, he's calling you to glorify him. Are you with me now? Brothers and sisters, it is when we maintain our integrity, it is when we hold fast to the word of God in the most adverse situations that God now gains the opportunity to give a clear manifestation of his character. And the world needs to see this revelation of God. Brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to get thrown into our furnace that's going to be heated up seven times hotter than it's ever been heated before. But the Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter 12, looking at verse 1, are you there with me? Daniel chapter 12, looking at verse 1. The Bible says, and at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. The furnace is going to be heated up seven times harder. And in that hour, God is going to prove the hearts of his people. The silver will be revealed. In that hour, the glory of God will be made manifest in ways that people have never seen the character of God since Jesus himself walked the face of planet Earth. The Bible makes it clear. Revelation chapter 18, looking at verse 1. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, looking at verse 1, the Bible makes it clear, brothers and sisters, when you arrive there in your scriptures, just say amen. Are you there? Ah, oh, come on. Revelation 18, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his. This is the people of God filled with the Spirit of God. And what do they do? They lighten the entire world with the glory of God. Last time that happened was when Jesus died on the cross. Brothers and sisters, God wants to make himself known. The test and trials that the test and trials that lie right before us are to prove us. The crisis is right before us. It is that furnace that will be heated up seven times hotter. But it is in this crisis that not only will we come to understand more perfectly than ever that God's word is pure, that we can trust him when every earthly support is cut off. But the universe, as well as ourselves, will be able to see a manifestation of the character of God that we've never seen before. God will use the hour to prove us. Matter of fact, go with me. Look at this. Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter... 66, I believe it is. Open your Bible there. Psalm chapter 66. Let's look at Psalm 66. And going to verse 10. Psalm 66 and verse 10. The Bible tells us here, For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. And how is silver tried? Placed, it's placed in the furnace of earth. Purified seven times. 
So then, brothers and sisters, whose hand is on the gauge when the time of trouble comes? You're not listening to me. Is Satan the one that's controlling the fire or is it God that's controlling the fire? That means it can't get hotter than it needs to get. But it's going to get as hot as it needs to get. Just enough to prove that God's word is pure. His hand is on the gauge. He has a special work that he's seeking to accomplish in us as we hold on to his word, passing through trial and tribulation, depending upon his never failing promises. Bible tells us, brothers, are you with me on this? Bible tells us he's trying to accomplish a work even now. Go with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi, the third chapter. Easy to find it. It's right, be it's right before you get to Matthew. Are you there? Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, the Bible says, And he, speaking of Jesus Christ, the messenger of the covenant, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Stop. Who are the sons of Levi? When the priesthood was removed from Aaron, it was given to the sons of Levi. The Bible says that Jesus even now is sitting as a refiner and purifier of silver. That means right now, all the trials and tribulations that we're passing through, the crisis that is right before us, these things are what God is using to develop his eternal priesthood. Amen. Bible says it, brothers, 1 Peter, go with me there, 1 Peter chapter 2. Where are we going in our Bibles? 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. You know the scripture. It says what? For ye are a... Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye might show forth the praises of him who called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. If he's calling you into his marvelous light, that means he's calling you to be like him. For in him is no darkness at all. Remember. When he returns, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And if you don't believe it, just go right back to 1 John chapter 3. Are you with me right now? 1 John chapter 3. For in 1 John chapter 3, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to begin again at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And how do we become purified? By holding on to the word of God that can cleanse us if we hold fast to it as we endure trial and tribulation. Brothers and sisters, God is going to have a people that will declare him to be true, that will declare him to be honest, that will declare that God does not lie, there's no darkness in him at all, and anything that God says, not only is it true, but every promise that he gives us, he always performs. He will have a people that will declare that, not with their mouths, but with their lives. The Bible warns us, though, in Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, in Romans, the third chapter, looking at the third verse, it says this. It says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Matter of fact, the very fact that these people don't believe and are not holding on to the faith of God lets us know that they're in sin. You know how I know that? 
The Bible says it right here. You open your Bible. Keep your finger right there. Go to Romans chapter 14. There's a point that the scripture is really trying to rivet in our minds. Romans chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 23. It simply says in Romans 14 and verse 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Here's the important part. For whatsoever is not of faith is... But it makes a lot of sense. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the... So whatever you do in this life that's not according to the word of God, it's outside of the will of God. So when the word of God says, so what if some do not believe? It's saying, what if some don't want to lay hold upon the power of the word of God so they can be transformed? What if some don't really believe that God's word is infallible and that every promise that he's given to us, it will surely come to pass as sure he, as he said it? Are you following? What if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief and continuing in a life of sin make the faith of God, make the power of the word of God to transform, to change, to bring life and light? Will their unbelief make the word of God and its creative power with no effect? You see the point? Are you seeing the point right now? Can your unbelief nullify the creative power of the word of God? Can your unbelief change that God's word of truth? Can your unbelief make one of God's promises fail? The Bible says, God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. And that thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. I thought the judgment was for us. Because the Bible just said there, when he is judged. So what is God going to be judged on? His word. The Bible says, what if some people don't want to believe? They don't want to go through the crisis. Any of these things, will it make God's word powerless? God forbid. God in the end of the controversy will be justified and he will overcome in the conclusion of this judgment hour. Because even if multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes of people refuse to place their faith in the word of God, God will have a remnant that will. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, and verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They have faith in the word of God. He's going to have a people. The question is, will you be one of them? Brothers and sisters, God has a special work that he wants to do in us. There is a major crisis before our faces. It cannot be averted, and it is coming at a rapid pace. Brothers and sisters, to be quite honest, everything that we've been looking at this week is really to brace us for the crisis. That we might know how to be prepared to stand in our hour when the furnace is heated up seven times hotter than we've ever felt it before. But just as Jesus stand, stood with the three Hebrew faithfuls on the plain of Dura, he will stand with those in these last days that embrace the three angels' messages. God will have a people that will reveal that his word is pure. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Brothers and sisters, God has been trying to raise up a generation that would serve him with fullness of heart for all too long. And it is clear from the events that are taking place at a, rap taking place at a rapid pace in our world that he is getting ready to commission the four angels of Revelation chapter 7 to loose the winds. And the word of God says, then that ensues, there will be a time of trouble on planet earth. But in that hour, he will have a people that are sealed 
his truth hidden in their hearts because day by day hour after hour under temptation and trial in the home in the workplace wherever they went they stood upon the word of God and they tested it and they tested it and they proved it in their lives to be true God wants you to be one of those people he wants you to be one of those people and this is your decision if tonight you want to say Lord I want to be one of those earthen vessels that you can use to lighten this world with your glory. I want to be like a Martin Luther that will stand for you even if the world is against me and say, here I stand upon the word of God and I can go no further. God is looking for men and women like that in this hour. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I love Paul, but he's not here anymore. I love to read the stories about Elijah, but he's not here anymore. Neither is Elisha. John the Baptist, Peter, all of these mighty men of God, none of them are here anymore. Here in the final hour, God in his wisdom puts you here. Because what he designs to do through you he couldn't do through Paul. <laughs> if he could do it through Paul, then Paul would be here. What he designs to do through you, he couldn't do through Peter. Not even Elijah. God is seeking to do a final miraculous work through you. But it's your decision. If tonight you want to say, Lord, I indeed truly want to be a vessel of your glory. I want you to fill my life with your presence. If that's your desire. I invite you to come down front this evening. I'd like to say a special word of prayer for you. one more appeal I'll make and then I'll close in prayer and it's for you my friend you're here this evening it may be your first time here this may be their second or third time here nonetheless you are here because God brought you here and he wants you to understand that he has a specific design that he wants to accomplish in your life but he'll never be able to do that as long as you continue to walk in dark places he wants you to step out of the darkness into his marvelous light and tonight you realize the Spirit of God himself spoke to your heart and told you that his design for you is that you are transformed into one of these vessels that God can use for his eternal glory if it is your desire to answer that call that appeal that the Spirit has made to your heart this evening to give yourself wholly to the service of God to come out of the darkness of this world and step into the light of the kingdom of God. And you'd like to receive studies in preparation for baptism. I invite you to raise your hand. Is there anyone like that this evening that would like to make that dedication of your life to God? And without any further ado, I want to invite you to pray with me. Let's ask God to seal the decisions that we have made. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your word. It faileth not. And Father, we realize this evening that in this plan of salvation, in this great controversy which we find ourselves in, our obedience is not only the issue that's at stake. Our own lives are not the only issue that's at stake. Your character. Your character is at stake. And in reality, that should mean more to us than our own lives. Because if you were not the God that you are, we couldn't even have breath to call upon your name. But because you laid down your life for us, we now have an opportunity to live 
because of the type of person you are. Almighty God, we pray this evening that you would purge these vessels that you made for your honor. Purge them of all the filth that we have defiled them with. Lord, make us afresh. Cleanse us. Refashion us in your image. Use us to accomplish your purposes. Help us to realize in every aspect of our lives that we can depend upon your word. As we leave your courts this evening, may these themes continue to pass over and over through the corridors of our mind until we are firmly established on the platform of the word of God. Thank you for hearing this prayer. For we ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.